I hope we find each of you safe and healthy at home. I'm thrilled to welcome you to Authors in Quarantine Community Book Talks with Julie Bearer. This is one of many virtual ways the JCC is connecting with our community right now while our building is closed. So please be sure to join our email list and check our website to learn about our offerings, including daily meditation, films, and much more. While we can't see you in the building, we really do love seeing you online. Tonight's conversation is in the capable hands of our friend, Julie Bearer. A native New Yorker, Julie began her career as a bookseller at Shakespeare and Company. Her first job in publishing was at Stanford J. Greenberger Associates. Julie started her own agency, Bearer Literary, in 2004. In 2015, with three other partners, she launched the book group. Julie represents a variety of writers across a literary spectrum with a special emphasis on fiction. Books she represents that were published in the last year include Inheritance by Danny Shapiro, Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson, Book of V by Anna Solomon, Patsy by Nicole dennis Ben, and Dear Edward by Ann Napolitano. There will be time for your questions tonight, so please feel free to submit them at any point during the conversation by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And lastly, if you have yet to read tonight's featured books, I encourage you to order through our friends at Book Culture who are making special arrangements for eBooks as well as contactless pickup. And now join me in welcoming Julie Bear. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Megan. And thank you everybody at the JCC. I'm so excited to be here for the third installment um, of our little conversations with authors. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't see all of you. I can see these two amazing women, which is like just bringing me in a tremendous amount of joy. Um, so tonight here with me, Lily King and Madeline Miller. Here are their books. I strongly encourage you to purchase them, download the audio, download the ebook, do all three, I don't care. Um, you can do it through Book Culture, you can do it through bookshop.org, you can probably do it through your local library, but books and their authors really need your support at this time. Um, so I hope you will consider, uh, if you haven't yet, after this wonderful event. Um, these two amazing women have been my clients for almost 10 years. Um, Madeline Miller uh, came to me through what we call the slush pile, uh, which is when authors write in a query letter to an agent that they don't know, and it goes, uh, it, it used to be a big stack of letters. Um, now it's an inbox, like so many things. Um, she didn't know me, and she didn't say why she picked me. Maybe she'll tell us later. Um, but I was so thrilled that she did, and she won me over immediately with her query. Uh, for a book that later was titled The Song of Achilles. We won't tell you the original title because it's, it's not so good. <laughs> yeah, it was a little. Anywho, um, that was her first novel and her second novel has just come out in paperback. That's Circe. Um, and uh, it's been a tremendously exciting experience to watch Madeline go from a debut author who hadn't published anything before to a prize winning number one New York Times bestselling, critically acclaimed writer. Um, I did not have the privilege of representing Lily King's first books. I did, however, have the honor of receiving an email from her in 2012 after she had unfortunately lost a very dear friend and agent of hers that she had worked with since the beginning of her career. And luckily for me, uh, two of her friends, an editor and an agent, had recommended me as a good fit. And I just, oh, I'm so excited. I was such a huge fan of her books. And she had just finished um, what was really a departure for her at the time. And that was a novel called Euphoria and was a foray for her into historical fiction. Lily's latest book, Writers and Lovers, um, is here right beside me. And I encourage you to pick this up, pick up her backlist. And I'm so excited to welcome them to this conversation. Thank you ladies for joining me. I'm so glad we're here together. Um, I want to start with a question for both of you that I've been asking some of the other writers that I've talked to and that is could you tell us a little bit about your writing routine? 
um, what it was like for you pre in, in what I like to call the before times, <laughs> um, pre COVID, what kind of what you're, you know, were you the kind of person who needed to sit down in the morning and get a certain number of words down on the page or did you wait until the muse came to you? Um, and how has that changed? In the, in the new times. And Lily, I will start with you. Okay. Thank you, Julie, so much for that lovely introduction. I'm so, so pleased and honored to be here tonight. And it's a special treat to be with Madeline because I worship her work. So it's very, very, very special. And vice versa. <laughs> um, okay, so your question. Um, so there's the ideal you know, there's the ideal and there's the reality. Yes. The ideal is that, um, I mean, it, the ideal used to be that I woke up at 5.30 in the morning and I worked until about noon or one or two. Then I had children. They like 5.30 very much. They <laughs> and, um, and so I lost all of, my, all of my morning hours for a long time. And then they went to school. And um, I could have my morning hours back if I worked it out with my husband. But honestly, the ideal day is now I just wake up, I have breakfast like a normal person, um, and I take my cup of tea up to my study, I glance at the paper, um, and, then, and then I'm at my desk, you know, nine o'clock to three o'clock, kind of banker's hours, you know. Um, that, that, is, that is the ideal. Um, and then with a little exercise and socializing, you know, in the, in the, in the later part of the afternoon. And oh. during, let me interrupt, during all those hours in your ideal world, are you just writing, writing, writing? Or some of it is like sitting at your desk thinking? Oh, so much of it is sitting at my desk thinking. It's so funny because I keep a writing log of, of how much I've written and the, I read right by hand. And so the back of every notebook, I write the day that I have written and how much I wrote. And, and since it's by hand and in a notebook, you know, sometimes it says four lines, you know, and, and, uh, but they were four good ones. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> and I did have someone ask me one time, like you sit for six hours and you write four lines. How is that possible? And it's very, very possible. Easy. The time goes by quickly. You know, you're thinking, you think you're writing, you might not be writing you're reading, you know, you're falling asleep in the chair. Um, but I think it's important to get to the desk. I never ever wait for inspiration to strike because um, I would be waiting a very, very long time. It, uh, fiction writing is, is just, you know, ass in the chair. <laughs> a big part of it. I'm struck by the fact that you glance at the news and I'm wondering whether uh, in these strange days, if that has become, if that has impeded your ability to get those words on the page. Or yeah, I mean, for a long, like, you know, we get the newspaper, the New York Times delivered to our house. I live in Maine, in Portland, Maine. And um, that, you know, even at the beginning of this last, you know, presidency administration, I would look, you know, I would really just kind of glance at the editorials. And then COVID hit and, um, you know, we are like a lot of people we were freaked out about touching the newspaper, right? And so we didn't touch it for a long time, but we didn't cancel our subscription, but I'd look online. But really, I just kind of, I've really, really tried to stay away um, in the morning as much as I can. I get a certain newsletter by historian in Boston and I really like that. It like catches me up, but doesn't get me all wound up. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so has your routine changed a lot these last few months? It has. You know, it's tricky because I'm on book tour. And that has really, right. even though it's a virtual book tour, it's still really affected my writing routine. It's very hard for me to start something new while I'm, you know, out there talking about my brand new book. Yeah. And it, it's unfortunate that that is because I talk about my writing process all the time, but I'm not writing. And so I feel... A little bit like a fraud, um, but I, I am not just, a fraud. I'm here to testify. <laughs> just in the past week, um, I have been just struck by an idea that I thought had passed me by, and um, I thought it was one of those those ideas that you get after a novel and you actually don't develop. You know, it just 
and, but it's come back to me and it's just been going crazy, crazy on me. And so it's, it's, um, I spent all day just daydreaming, taking notes, putting things together, reading certain things about I'm things. So was really excited to find out what this is. <laughs> I'm Do excited you find if you don't pay attention to it, it will go away? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Or, or, or it will, um, I can't remember it as well as I used to, you know, I have to get it all down quickly. Uh, I, I used to, I think, I don't even know if this is true, but I have an idea of <laughs> how I used to be. And, you know, I could, I could have hold a lot of things in my head and a whole story and lots and lots of details without writing it down. But, but that's not true for me right now. So I write it all down. And you write everything longhand. When do you transfer to the computer? It depends. If I'm stuck, I start transferring. If, I, if I'm going and going, I'll fill a whole notebook. And then I have to spend, I'm such a slow typist that I have to spend, you know, two or three months pull, typing in the, the whole thing. And so people are always like, how's your writing going? I'm like, oh, I'm just typing. I'm, you know. <laughs> I really like I really like that process, you know, that revision process. Getting in there. You realize as you type, like as you type, or like I'm writing the sentence, but the sentence doesn't feel right. Yes, yes. And I'll add a whole new paragraph, and you wow. know, it, I, it's a very creative um, endeavor as well as editorial. It's kind of like the creator and the critic are working in tandem at that moment. It's kind of my favorite favorite step of the process. Yeah. Cause I have something to work with, you know? And so it feels, it feels good. Yeah. Yeah. So Madeline, will you tell us about your writing routine? Sure. Um, so I pre COVID, um, and again, Lily, I loved how you talked about the ideal versus what actually happens, <laughs> but <laughs> the ideal is that I, I start in the morning and, you know, around nine o'clock or eight o'clock, um, and I would sort of write until, you know, maybe noon and until I hit a snag, sort of a major snag, and then I go and work out. And that is actually a really important part of my process. It doesn't have to be involved. It can be going to the gym or taking a walk. Now it's just taking a walk. Um, but that's really important to me. And I feel like all the stuff that I've been sort of churning through in the morning, I work out as I'm walking, moving my body always moves my brain. So um, then I get all these ideas and I come back home and I write those down. Um, and then I, I have two young children. So then I go and I'm, I'm with my young children for most of the afternoon and the, and the evening. Um, and then after everybody goes to bed, that's my favorite time to write. Really? <laughs> and midnight. Yeah. No way. You can write it like after dinner and after bedtime. You're not sort of like, let me just lie here on the couch and look at Twitter. Like oh no, no, I got, I have to go because I have, so part of my writing process is actually that I need like a dim, dim room is ideal. And oh. sometimes I even look a little creepy because I have this hood that I pull over. So it's like, you know totally obscuring my vision you have, like, I, noise canceling headphones like no no i i because that bugs my ears i don't oh. know i <laughs> i should have that um but so so nighttime is perfect because there's no sound and there's no light and it's just me and the the idea wow and yeah. how late can do you like go into the night or are you like okay it's like one in the morning i gotta get to bed I, one in the morning is usually my hard cut off, but I have, I, I go right up to 1 a.m. <laughs> if I can. Yeah. And oftentimes I'll close the computer, lie in bed for five minutes, then reopen the computer and jot down the last, <laughs> the last bits. You don't have to be like at your desk doing your routine. It can be like on the fly. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, so if I'm really being totally honest, I prefer to write <laughs> <laughs> from a reclining position. Oh, it's very, it's very Roman. That's what I tell myself. Like, um, like way back? <laughs> like Are you in bed? <laughs> Are you in bed? And yes, yes comfortable chairs. Awesome. Yeah, a desk feels so... Uh, draconian to me. I feel like, how can anyone work at a desk? That feels so cruel. Um, <laughs> True. So, <laughs> no, no I, for Madeline Miller. <laughs> <laughs> 
so and now I feel really embarrassed. I feel like this makes me sound, you know, very debauched or something, but I, I, I have to be comfortable. I would say that you're doing okay with whatever routine you've got yeah, exactly. going there, my friend. Now, how has, how has these challenging times changed that ideal routine? Because you do have two small children and they are at home. They are. They are at home and their wonderful grandparents who live nearby are very high risk. And so we're not, we, it's basically just us. We're not getting grandparental help right now. Um, so for, I would say for about three months, there was total chaos. There was just, everything was up <laughs> <not> the <laughs> And we were sort of trying to figure out, I, on top of this, I actually had a concussion during this time. So I was a little bit, um, there. that was sort of added on top of everything. But I, I think we were trying to figure out what schedule works best for the children. How can we structure their days? How can we sort of help them? And so really all our energy was going to that. Um, and I felt like the news, everything that was going on was so much that my brain was just not really able to think about the book. And then sort of around the three month mark, I felt like we had stabilized things and my brain started returning to the book that I was working on. And actually I find it total solace now. I feel like I'm sneaking away to think about the book when, <laughs> whenever I can. Uh -huh. um, and it's much more kind of catch as catch can now that I, I don't have those big blocks of time. Um, I sort of try to find an hour here, an hour there. My, my best friend, 9 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, is always there for me. So I, I'm, I'm doing it much more on the fly. And, um, but I, I am really, I'm finding a lot, of, a lot of comfort in living in the world of the book. I love that you both are talking about that. I mean, Lily with her new idea and you with this new project, you both talk about um, your time to really dig into these books as, as filling your soul and really exciting. I mean, I think, um, I know it's hard, but it sounds like it's equal parts um, hard and also really like, meaningful and happy making mm -hmm. and I wonder um if you could talk a little bit about you know why that's like is, I assume you feel like that's so important because right now it's hard to find those things that bring us joy and that feel kind of like our own little private thing mm. I, I I also can I just add on a question for oh. I'm, I'm so curious if um this time and all of its you know, craziness and facets is feeding in to what you're writing. Like, you know, is it affecting it? Because I, I find that coming in to my book in unexpected ways. Yes, absolutely. I, I do think it's feeding in. Although it's also some of the things I was planning on writing about um, were, are sort of resonating strangely with what's happening, although I was writing about them before. So, yeah there is a, a character who's quite ill in my novel and, and that had happened, that was happening way before the pandemic started. And so working on those scenes is really uh, sort of strange for me. Um, and especially because a lot of the symptoms of the illness are actually very similar to the symptoms of, of COVID. So it, it feels sort of bizarre to be working on that. Um, but also uh, I, I'm not sure how it's all feeding in, but I, I feel like it is. I feel like at first it was just this fire hose. And now I feel like my brain is starting to, to chew on it. Now my brain is starting to process it. Is that how it is for you? Yes, yes. I, I, it, it is all about processing. And, and, you know, I always say that, oh, I don't write about things until, you know, it's 20 or 30 years later. And then I finally can really think about it. But with this, it seems like um, I am needing fiction to process this, probably because it is so much, you know? It's like how we're all having really crazy dreams, right? Yeah. When you read this great article about how like your brain needs to let you have those dreams yes. because it's actually too much to process. Yes. During the daytime when you're awake, you kind of can't handle it. So it's your brain's way of managing it all. Yeah, yeah, it makes so much sense. 
I think it's really interesting, Lily. I was thinking as you were just talking because the last book you, this book, your yeah, last, I was thinking about that too. It's also a book where you, I feel like you processed a lot as you were writing, and I think surprised yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I really needed. I I created that book so I could write about my mother's death, um, and to really uh, ha have a have a place to put all those feelings that. Um, and, and my journal just wasn't enough, you know? I needed, I, I, I needed to creatively work through it somehow. I needed scene and dialogue for, to, to really express those sort of deeper things that were happening. And I do wonder if this time is sort of the same thing. Like it, it's so big and I have, I have so much feeling about it that, that it's kind of overflowing, you know, into my work in a way that regular life doesn't, necessary. I mean, it always does, but not in this more dramatic way. Yeah. Yeah. And Madeline, I'm thinking what's interesting to me is that um, you write these historical novels, these ancient novels. And yet I think in both the books that you've written previously, there have been these things similar to the illness that you're describing where you, as a reader, I think, wow, this is set in, in, in the ancient times. And yet I'm so connecting with it. So true right now and what does that mean like is that is that telling me that the human experience the, the sort of the basic emotions and relationships haven't really changed over time i feel that way i feel when i when i read the ancient myths and the ancient literature i feel like there is so much there that is just resonates right across the centuries you know there there it isn't just situations there are even sort of particular relationships that just feel so um, fresh and so current and sometimes it just needs a little imagination to to kind of open that up and, and let the possibility be there changing the perspective for instance um, looking at side characters and allowing them to speak but I, I absolutely have always felt that resonance and so it's something I, I feel really passionately about um, in my writing and I, I was I mentioned this a couple different times but you know speaking of like could not be more current the iliad kicks off with an argument about how leaders are handling a pandemic <laughs> that's the first scene of the iliad so you know nothing new under the sun yeah yeah wow it's interesting because both of you were talking about writing being a way to connect to your own mm -hmm. feelings and our our emotions and our anxieties and our fears and our trauma. I wonder if you think about reading in the same way. Like, do you, I have found my reading habits have really changed over the last four months and I am reading much more for escape. Um, and I started uh, Maggie O'Farrell, who's a writer I just adore. I started her new novel, um, which comes out later this month, Hamnet, which is amazing. Is already very sad, and I was like, "I this is gonna be hard. Like, I'm not sure I can be sad right now in my reading." And I wonder if you're what you're feeling about having those emotions stimulated when you're reading. Yeah, I very, I very much felt that. I've had to put some books away that were just. I I, I knew they were very beautiful and important books that I couldn't handle. Um, yeah. I maybe could almost be ready to handle them now, but certainly at the beginning, I could not at all. Um, and I, I'm not, I, you know, I, I, I don't do like escape, um, it, you know, murder mysteries or um, I don't know, like, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I can't really go all that light and so it's hard to find, you yeah. know, um, comfort books that are very literary and, you know, have beautiful sentences that aren't about really dark subjects, you know? Um, yeah. so I've and had to be, you know. I'm going to look at my shelves later and send you some suggestions. I feel like <laughs> you'd be able to find something. Yeah. Send them to me too. Yeah. <laughs> are you feeling the same way? Um, I... 
have I'm I'm doing a lot of rereading, and I that's always my my comfort. Um, James Baldwin is one of my oldest comfort reads, so I've been rereading through his his work. Um, I reread Writers and Lovers, uh, which <laughs> was wonderful, and I feel like that the way you Lily deal with grief, but also humor, and it's all the humanity of it, the, the willingness to allow both those things to exist together is so, is so beautiful, and I feel like really healing right now. Mm. Um, so re, for me, I've been doing a lot of rereading. Um, I did read A Burning, um, which has, I, has been on a, a lot of wonderful lists. Um, and I felt like that was really interesting because it's actually dealing with a lot of the things that we are dealing with right now in the US, but not set in the US. Yeah, yeah. And so somehow that was, I, it, it allowed just that slight distance <laughs> for, for me to, you know, be able to be able to read it. I loved it. I thought it was a great book. I feel, um, the same way. I feel like if you put me in another country, then I kind of have the distance a yeah. little bit. Um, and time, time certainly helps a little bit of distance. Yeah. Yeah. I, I started, re I read um, The Splendid and the Vile, Eric Larson's Oh, book, yeah. Winston Churchill. And I really needed that. Like, I, I, I needed to be um, in a country with a leader who was a brave, self sacrificing patriot who just was never going to give up on on the people in his country you know and I just I was so moved by that and I felt so comforted by that even though it was about the blitz you know it was, it was right that only in the time of the London bombing but there was so there there was um there was just so much you know uh courage and humanity in it yeah do you feel like when you're working on a book, you need to be reading something that's really different from what you're working on? Or are you not really reading when you're working, when you're really, really in it? I feel, I, I don't read other people's uh, myth retellings. Right in general when I'm working on that. And, and right now I'm working on a piece that's inspired by Shakespeare. So I'm not reading any no pamphlets of Shakespeare. For you, so. Yeah, nothing. Um, but uh, anything else is, is fine. Anything else is, is great. I just don't wanna have, I, I don't want my brain to start worrying that I'm taking something or not taking something or, you know. Is it so, weird to read like, like a book that's set in, 2020 you know 2019 in New York City while you're working on Shakespeare like do you know what I mean is that oh yeah no no I love doing that <laughs> I yeah I love I love reading all of it I for me when I was a kid I read completely indiscriminately like literally I would just like go through the shelf next thing next thing next thing you know with no and so I I love to read across a big a big spectrum when I'm writing because I feel like it's all going in there in its own way. It's all helping me think um, about, you know, what I'm doing. So anything else that's not deliberately touching on retelling Shakespeare is, is great and, and always really feeds me. It, it, I, I mean, I love seeing masterful writers do what they do. I love, you know, reading it once and being blown away by what they've done and then reading it again and saying, how did they do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I just read whatever, whatever feeds me and feeds the novel. I mean, when I'm at a certain point, usually, you know, kind of at the end or at the beginning of the revision, I can get really picky about my reading because I'm looking for something that's gonna give me the key to all of my doubts and, you know, it's gonna unlock everything. What is that? Do you find it? Doesn't <laughs> it doesn't exist. And so I'm like, no, that's not it. That's not it. And I'm always like throwing books away. Then I have to go back to them because, of course, they're great books and I right. you know, should have read them. It's but, your um, book that's doing that. Nobody else's book is doing that. I, <laughs> but I don't know that. I can't tell myself that at that moment. I feel so lost and, and like I need to, you know, like I'm... I still remember when you sent me your, your draft of this and you were so like, I don't know. Oh, 
And I called Lily. I was so, I was sobbing. I was so hysterical. That was honestly like the happiest moment of my life. I had to pick up the phone and call her, but I was so hysterical. I couldn't actually get the words out. <laughs> I was like blabbering for five minutes. <laughs> it was so great. Oh. Right. It was a great, it was a oh, great feeling. That's one of my favorite parts of the job. Um, I wanted to ask, cause you two have written really different books. I mean, they're, you know, very different subjects, but at the heart of both of these books are um, young women, women who are really learning like who they are and what their story is, right? They've, they've had impressed upon them by their families, by their fathers, both have very overbearing, very strong fathers. Mm -hmm. An idea about who they're supposed to be, who they're allowed to be in the world, and whether they're allowed to have these dreams, right? I mean, both of them are on a journey to find their voice, and by the end, be like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> It's my time now. <laughs> and I just, I just wanted to talk a little bit about whether that, was, whether that was in the front of either of your minds as you were writing these women or, you know, whether it wasn't until after they were written that you thought, oh, this is a story of a woman, you know, who's really finding her strength and finding her story or whether you set out to tell that kind of story. Madeline, I'll start with you. Um, I... It, I did set out to tell it because one of the things that I, I loved about the figure of Circe from mythology is that although she is the daughter of a goddess, actually what what makes her interesting is that she is a witch and she's one of the first witches in literature. And her witchcraft is very different from her divinity. You know, divine power in the ancient Greek myths is sort of like, bam, shazam, I make something happen. Whereas witchcraft is you know, dedication, experience, skill, expertise, knowledge, it's hard work. Mm -hmm. And so as from sort of the very first moments I thought about Circe, I thought of her as an artist and that her witchcraft is her art. And so to me, this was the story of an artist coming into her power and, you know, witchcraft as sort of a metaphor for the way art can transform the world. Although I didn't just want it to be metaphorical, I wanted it to be real witchcraft um, in the novel. Uh, because, you know, this is a world of, of magical, uh, you know, magical beings and mythical creatures and mythical realism. But for me, that that vision of her as an artist coming into her own, finding a place for her voice in a world that is really hostile to her voice was really key. Mm. And did you find, I guess the second part of my question for both of you will be, what did it what did it feel like for you to write a woman's story like that? Like, was it per, did you have a personal feeling as you were giving her that voice? I did. You know, one of the things that is funny, so now that I've said that I, I saw her as an artist the whole time, I feel like that that metaphor was slightly buried in my mind as I was working on it because I wrote this whole section where Circe has been exiled from her father's halls. She's landed on this magical island of Aiaia where we famously see her in the Odyssey turning men into pigs. And she's first discovering her power on the island. And I wrote this whole section about her learning how to use witchcraft. And then I went back and read it and I was like, this whole section sounds exactly like my writing process. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't mean to do that, but. That's hilarious, and I'm totally going back. <laughs> I was like, hmm, lots of trial and error, lots of throwing stuff out, lots of not knowing what you're doing. This is really. <laughs> So, you know, I feel like my brain was creating that metaphor even sort of unconsciously as, as I was working on it. And, and reading back through it and editing the piece did start to feel very, very personal because I, I felt like I, I wanted her to, to have that voice. And I, I, you know, living through it and living through her journey was a very 
I don't know, I, I have a friend who calls me a, um, a method writer, which is that sort of like a method actor that I kind of put on the character and live inside the character. And so it, it really did kind of feel that way. I felt like I was living through this character's journey. And it took me seven years to write Cersei. So it was a long time of living through her journey. And it came to be incredibly, incredibly meaningful to me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, to all of us who've read it too. Mm -hmm. And what I loved about, uh, you know, you call it witchcraft, but it's so of the earth, you know, it, it's not the kind of magic, you know, li like what the gods have. And th th that it's going to be of lightning power. and it's suddenly like lightning in your hand. Right, right. I mean, she has to go and she has to, you know, find it in the earth. And, and, and it really is such a, um, it, it truly is a process. And when I was reading, I, uh, that was really my first enjoyable COVID read um, was Circe. And I just like, I, I just was so amazed at how much I loved it, you know? That's a good I, I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I think just because, you, you know, I, 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 I don't know, you know, I, I mean, I'm not a big like- I think it's a book that surprises people who don't think of themselves as either historical fiction readers yeah. or fantasy readers or necessarily interested in magic or, I mean, I think that has been the joy of watching the book, you know, kind of woo and, and capture the hearts of all these people who are like, I don't think that book's for me, but I guess it's like, you know, everybody seems to be talking about it. And I did, I did have the thought that, wow, she's just like Casey. You know, I saw a she lot is, of similarities right? as I was reading it. Yes. And part of it is that I really don't know what my books are about at all until after they're published and reviewers start weighing in and they start telling me what my book is about. You know, that's how I find out really. And so at that point I would gotten a lot of reviews. So I now knew what my book was about. And I was like, Oh, that sounds like a, a book I just wrote. Is that why we argued about jacket copy? Because you were like, my book's not about that. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm terrible at jacket copy. Oh my God. I'm always so surprised what, what people think that book's about. So, and, and so when you were setting out to write her, what did you I mean, that wasn't a factor in your mind at all. I mean, some of it had, you You are even closer than Madeline is to yeah. her. I mean, you are a writer and she is a writer. Yeah. You're watching her go down this path that you know direct experience from. I know. And I mean, I knew it was about her and I knew that, um, you know, she was about my age and she lived where I did when I uh, wrote my first novel. And, you know, so there were, I knew that there were, that there were parallels to our lives. And, um, and I, I knew her arc. I mean, I knew, I knew her situation and I, I knew where I wanted to take her. Um, but really, you know, when I'm writing those first drafts, I'm just trying to capture someone's emotional experience, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not thinking about it thematically. I'm not doing the English teacher thing. Right, of, right. You know, thinking about theme and symbol and that kind of thing. I'm really, I'm really just like trying to, to feel my way. And literally, I mean, I'm feeling my way in the dark, but I'm also like feeling my way because I'm so, yeah. the only thing I'm interested in is, is the emotion. Emotional, yeah. And, and everything else is just oh, true. The real feelings, how you're getting that across. So. Yeah. Yeah. And how I can make that as clear as possible, um, you know, with draft after draft. And so then, and then, you know, then I, then I, I can get some distance and I can see, Oh, okay. And, and especially all the stuff about men. I mean, I wasn't intentionally thinking, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to take down the patriarchy. In this <laughs> I was, you wrote incredibly feminist books, I think. I'm not thinking about that. I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to feel what my character is feeling. And, you know, I have a female character who lives in a patriarchy. And so she's going to observe that if she's, if she's, you know, aware enough. So what I think of that book is that it, it it's a great gift to the younger you and it, it, I feel like you see that in the reviews and you see people like on Twitter talking about how like this is the book I needed when I was a young mm. woman writer feeling like did I have the right 
to be doing this? Did I, did I dare? I mean, that's what both women, both Cersei and Casey are saying. Do I dare seize this moment and take it for myself? Yeah. And do I have the right to go down this path and to want what I want? Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So good. All right, where am I with my questions? Uh, da, 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 da. Um, are there, is there a question that either of you wishes uh, in these book talks or when you go to events or you do readings that like nobody ever asked, you're like, how come nobody ever asked about the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you often get asked to say a lot of the same questions. So is there a question that Nobody's thought of, but you're like, one thing that really mattered to me when I was working on this book, or one thing that I really love about my own book. I mean, I could talk about all the things I love about your book, but is there something that is meaningful to you that you've, you're like, oh, it's, that's a thing that people should know? Mm. Or maybe not. I guess for me, it's tricky because I can't really talk about it now because it's the last scene. Oh. Um, but <laughs> I, I wish um, oh, I had this one book club that I talked to, uh, and and we talked about the last scene and and kind of the the meaning, you know. And I was really surprised that what I said really surprised them, and they hadn't thought about it that way. And I you thought it was you thought it was so clear yeah. what your intention was. Yeah. And yeah. then you said, I mean, I think that that must happen to a lot of writers, right? Where you're like, I thought I made it pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then you're like, oh. Yeah. And they had a very different interpretation of it. And actually that happened with Euphoria too. There were all kinds of like. Oh, I remember that, yeah. Who died at the end and how was, you know. <laughs> a lot of debate. Of debate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about you, Madeline? I I always love it when people ask me um, sort of in-depth questions about about how I develop the psychology for characters because for me what I love what Lily was saying about that feeling that the feeling is is central um, it's it's that way for me too and I love part of what I think is often missing from myth or or maybe missing is is not the right word because I think it's intentionally this way um is that is that myth is all about these big moments but it doesn't really zero in on the psychology sort of the like the hamlet soliloquy of these characters and part of what I love to do is sort of take the myths and create the psychology from them and sort of okay this is what the character does in mythology so how does that how can I make that make sense for a real flesh and blood, three-dimensionally, psychologically real person. Um, and so sometimes people will ask me sort of specific questions about that. And I always enjoy getting into it because I've thought about it a lot in terms of the myths and what myths I was using and what was informing it. And so it's, I, you know, it's kind of like a nerd out answer for me, but I enjoy, <laughs> I enjoy that. Who is the woman who chooses to give birth to the Minotaur? <laughs> Oh, she's an interesting woman. I mean, I mean her, and she is so interesting in the book, and you just love to hate her. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, speaking of questions, we've now come to the portion of the evening where uh, you are welcome to ask me any questions you might have. Oh, Lily looks very excited. I did. I wrote one down. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, you know. I want you to answer this question, okay? I don't want you to brush it off. Okay. Um, I ever brushed you off? <laughs> you have such an incredible reputation. And, and since, you know, we started working together, your reputation has only grown and grown. And like everybody in the book world and outside the book world that I talk okay. to often seems to know, you know, your name and who you represent and how good you are, right? I mean, they, you know, People are so it. jealous of me having you as an agent. I can't even tell you. And I just got so lucky. I, I don't even know how that happened. But the, the, my question is, what is the, what is the Julie Bear magic? What, what, <laughs> how exactly? I, I can tell you exactly what the Julie Bear magic. It's you guys. No, 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 no. Yes. I'm, not, I'm not saying that to no. the question. I'm saying that an agent is only as good as the books they represent, right? That's what builds your reputation is 
um, is having books on your list that people love. It's not, it's not about having bestsellers. It's about having books that people are like, I carried that book with me for an entire year. And then I, and I gave it to my sister and I gave it to my mother and I gave it to my brother-in-law and he doesn't like anything I give him. And you know, that, I don't think it, I don't think the secret sauce is like, I'm such a great negotiator or I'm so good at marketing plans or I'm, you know, I, I think the secret is that like, when I'm lucky enough to have a Madeline Miller or a Lily King come across my desk, I recognize it mm -hmm. and I drop everything and I'm like, I will do anything it takes to be part of that author's life in the world. And do you always feel about that way about, you know, the, the books that you represent and, yes. um, Teresa Parker. You never think to yourself, I should probably represent this because I know it will be big, even though I'm not feeling it. I know the market and that kind of thing. As it becomes a cross around your neck. I mean, Teresa Park, who was my mentor in the business, always said to me, you should feel about each thing you take on, like you would be willing to give this all up and go start a publishing company just to publish that book because it's so important to you to have that book in the world. And if you don't feel that way about it, walk away wow. because you're going to spend the next year and a half or two years banging on everybody's door to get them to pay attention to that book. And if you don't believe in it with every fiber of your being, now I will say I'm very privileged to be at a point in my career where I can make those choices. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I made those choices exactly when I was a 25 year old, you know, assistant and just starting to take books on and my list looked a little different then. And it, and I didn't have the financial security of being successful for many years to be able to say, you know, I know that book is going to sell for a million dollars and I am happy for it to be somebody else's million wow. dollars. Yeah. But now I'm lucky enough to be in that position and it feeds, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, if you only, if you only sign books that you really love, then every day you will get to work. Mm -hmm. that bring you joy and mm -hmm. so even if you don't sell them or even if they sell and they come out and nobody reviews them or buys them you will still at the end of the day have filled your day with something that you truly believe in and love and I don't think I have like better taste than everybody I think I was like I'm lucky sometimes to get there first <laughs> and I'm like it's mine all mine you can't have it <laughs> I hope I didn't feel like I was brushing that off. I just, you no, know. No, that was, that was very I really do think it's the books that make, you know, the agent. It's not, it's not the fancy agent. It's just the authors and the books. Can I ask just one follow-up before yeah. my last yeah. question? <laughs> you, are you finding those books in COVID? Or is your reading changed your taste? Your, you know, has yeah. it? Yeah, you my and that has messed with me totally. I mean, just on a time level, it's messed with me, right? I mean, I have a almost seven year old, and I have no babysitter and no camp, and um, and and first and foremost, the clients that I already represent are my priority. So, if I have a stack of manuscripts to read over the weekend, and two of them are from new writers, and five of them are from existing clients, the existing clients get the priority because. They need to be taken care of. And I don't, I don't really believe in like, like why would I prioritize somebody new over somebody I'm already working with? Um, so part of it is time. And part of it is I really, really, the distraction level and anxiety level and um, trying to find fiction that I can really sink my teeth into um, has been really hard for me. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but I did read an incredible short story collection recently mm. um, uh, that was set uh, in a part of Africa that I, you know, hadn't, hadn't read fiction about before. Mm. And it just was so new and different. And, and the way she used language was so exciting and interesting and I just I had that feeling I mean I put it down and I was like I have to call this woman right now and I have to represent this author wow. and if this is if this is what she can do with the story collection then like watch out world yeah. you know 10 years from now um but that's the only thing in like five months 
probably yeah. six months. I mean, it's probably been longer since I, you know, I only sign like two things, two, two things a year. I'm tough now. It's hard for me to fall in love. Wow. I have books from you guys to fall in love with. <laughs> That's so exciting. Okay, Madeline, your turn to ask me a question. Okay, well, first I have a follow-up to that. <laughs> Is it really seven manuscripts a weekend? Oh my gosh. I think I get through them. I'm just sitting there, sitting there on the desk. Oh. Oh my gosh. It is a lot of agita at night thinking about them. Yeah. Wow. Well, I want to echo everything Lily said about how incredibly fortunate that day that you opened my slush pile query letter, one of the most fortunate and lucky days of my life. Um, That's how I feel. <laughs> well, one of the reasons that I, that I really wanted to work with you is I felt like you really, um, invested in in your authors as sort of like not just in a particular book but in them growing and you know a, a lifelong um body of work and i loved the way you were a reader first and you you just were truly this incredibly thoughtful brilliant passionate reader <laughs> oh, <that's good> stuff. <laughs> I'm getting to my question, but, but that's part of it. <laughs> if I was an editor, I'd be like, where's your question? <laughs> here it comes, here it comes. Um, so the question is actually, given that you have this amazing skill set as a reader and as an editor, but also it seems to me as an agent that you have to have all these other skill sets, that you have to be able to do the business side to negotiate, to call the publicists, to think about, you know, to make the connections with bookstores, like that there's, it seems like you have to basically be able to do everything. And so how did you, how did you figure out how to do all that? I mean, a lot of it, I, I think you learn on the job. I had some really great mentors. I was incredibly lucky. Um, when I was at Sanford Greenberger, um, I worked with a woman named Teresa Park. Um, and I worked uh, in the same office as another agent named Elise Cheney. And they both really, really mentored me and really showed me a lot of the ways. And I think for, for me as a young woman, a lot of what they taught me was just like, don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to push. Like the worst thing that somebody can say is no. Mm -hmm. So if you get a marketing plan and it kind of looks to you like there's not a lot on it, push back. Mm -hmm. And then over time, I began to have more experience with better marketing plans. And then I would be like, oh, that thing that we did on that book, I want that on this book. Mm -hmm. And I want that on this book. And what else you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the hardest thing to learn wasn't sort of what to do. It was to in my early days to give myself permission to kind of bang on the door and be like, thanks for sending that. That's not enough. Or can I, can I get invited to that, you know, publicity luncheon and meet the booksellers? Can I be on the call with the sales rep? Can I, you know, can I get in the room? Can I be part of the conversation? Um, because I think learning sort of what to ask for or what, you know, a lot of that kind of isn't that hard if you have the time. Um, but I feel like you, they gave me permission to sort of be a little pushy. Mm -hmm. um, and they gave me permission to listen to myself. I mean, they both said to me when I started my own agency, like, you seem really good at fiction. Maybe you should just focus on that. <laughs> like, why aren't you just like going, you know, doubling down on that? And I was like, is that a thing you can do? <laughs> do the books you want to do and and um but I love that the job has is so many hats and I think that's part of what feeds me I love to edit and I love to read but I also like to you know come up with ideas for magazine pitches and stories and I love to meet booksellers because I used to be a bookseller and you know um I'm an extrovert so I I, I love and I I love getting to help in all the ways because essentially you're just holistically looking at the book and the author and being like, what are all the ways I can come up with to support its life out in the world? Like, that's fun, really. Okay, enough about me. Um, can you each read a tiny bit and then we're gonna take questions. Uh, Lily. Sure. Will you start us off? Um, and when you say tiny bit, uh, how, how, what, do you, what do you? Hi. Um, read a page you can read a paragraph you can read whatever you want okay um i'm just gonna start at the beginning do it 
I have a pact with myself not to think about money in the morning. I'm like a teenager trying not to think about sex, but I'm also trying not to think about sex or Luke or death, which means not thinking about my mother who died on vacation last winter. There are so many things I can't think about in order to write in the morning. Adam, my landlord, watches me walk his dog. He leans against his bends in a suit and sparkling shoes as I come back up the driveway. He's needy in the morning. Everyone is, I suppose. He enjoys his contrast to me and my sweats and untamed hair. When the dog and I are closer, he says, you're up early. I'm always up early. So are you, I say. Meeting with the judge at the courthouse at seven sharp. Admire me, admire me, admire judge and courthouse and seven sharp. Somebody's got to do it, I say. I don't like myself around Adam. I don't think he wants me to. I let the dog yank me a few steps past him toward a squirrel squeezing through some slats at the side of his big house. So, he says, unwilling to let me get too far away. How's the novel? He says it like I made the word up myself. He's still leaning against his car and turning only his head in my direction, as if he likes his pose too much to undo it. It's all right, the bees in my chest stir, a few creep down the inside of my arm. One conversation can destroy my whole morning. I've got to get back to it, short day, working a double. I pull the dog up out of Adam's back, back porch, unhook the leash, nudge him through the door, and drop quickly back down the steps. How many pages you got now? A couple of hundred, maybe. I don't stop moving. I'm halfway to my room at the side of his garage. You know, he says, pushing himself off his car, waiting for my full attention. I just find it extraordinary that you think you have something to say. So, thanks. Oh, God, that kills me. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. I mean, if that doesn't make all the people who are still here with us not want to go buy this book immediately, I really don't know <laughs> what's wrong with them. <laughs> Madeline, will you read us something? Sure. Um, so this comes from towards the middle of the novel after Cersei has already started turning men to pigs, which is what she's most famous for. Um, and the he in this passage is the Greek hero Odysseus. He asked me once, why pigs? We were seated before my hearth in our usual chairs. He liked the one draped in cowhide with silver inlaid in its carvings. Sometimes he would rub the scrolling absently beneath his thumb. Why not? I said. He gave me a bare smile. I mean it, I would like to know. I knew he meant it. He was not a pious man, but the seeking out of things hidden. This was his highest worship. There were answers in me. I felt them, very deep as last year's bulbs growing fat. Their roots tangled with those moments I had spent against the wall. And my lions were gone and my spell shut up inside me. After I changed a crew, I would watch them, scrabbling and crying in the sty, falling over each other, stupid with their horror. They hated it all. Their newly voluptuous flesh, their delicate split trotters, their swollen bellies dragging in the earth's muck. It was a humiliation, a debasement. They were sick with longing for their hands, those appendages men use to mitigate the world. Come, I would say to them, it's not that bad. You should appreciate a pig's advantages. Mud slick and swift, they are hard to catch. Low to the ground, they cannot easily be knocked over. They are not like dogs. They do not need your love. They can thrive anywhere, on anything, scraps and trash. They look witless and dull, which lulls their enemies, but they are clever. They will remember your face. They never listened. The truth is, men make terrible pigs. <laughs> so good, so good, so people. Good. I'm telling you, <laughs> right here. Um, okay, I'm gonna look at our chat and look at some questions and see um, what we are going to answer. Okay. Um, oh yes, I had this question too. Lily, would you mind sharing the name of the historian in Boston and the newsletter? Oh, um, all right, Heather Cox Richardson. Mm -hmm. And um, I get it delivered every morning. She, she, she takes the, the 
day's news and she starts writing, I, I hear, a friend of mine told me this, that she starts writing about eight, she takes a break for dinner, she goes back to it, she usually hits send around 2 a.m. So when I wake up in the morning, it's the first, e one of the first emails I see. And, um, and she, because she's a historian, she takes the most important kind of political events of the day and she puts it in context. Sometimes we can go back 200 years, sometimes we just go back a few months. She just, She's not, um, you know, hyper partisan, but she is definitely like um, uh, vigilant about what is being, what transgressions are 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 happening in this administration. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I just feel like it, it doesn't make me crazy <laughs> with anger, with steam coming out of my head, and. Uh, and and it and I love the historical context of it. So Heather Cox Richardson, and I think she calls it a letter from an American, something like that. Cool. And I think she has a paying subscription, but I get the free one, the free newsletter. But we should pay. We should pay writers for their. I know. I know. It's so true. I haven't even looked at that option, but I do see it now. <laughs> um, okay, I like this question. Um, do you miss your characters when you finish the book? I miss Cersei and was sad to finish the book. Do you guys feel that way? I do. I miss your characters. You can always reread it. I just, but it's not the same as it's not the same as not working, living with them every day. The way when you're writing the book. Yeah, I do. I do miss them. I do. I I remember with when I finished Song of Achilles, I I did my last edit and. I had this sort of feeling of I'm never going to write another scene for Achilles and Patroclus. Mm. That was it. And it, it was, it was really sad. And I felt like I had sort of a couple days of like letting them go and feeling sad about it. And I do feel that way with Cersei. Although I feel, I feel like in another sense, they're, they're always sort of there that I've lived with them for so long that they're kind of hanging out. They're like consciousnesses, consciousnesses that hang out in inside me. So I, I miss getting to spend time with them, but I do feel like they're still there. I really miss the ease of writing about them. You know, once you're, you've done several drafts, you know, you're, you're really comfortable with them. And then you start a new book and you're not comfortable. Everybody's so unfamiliar. You have to build that relationship right. all over again. It's like, a, you know, it, it is a new relationship, you know. And I, I, I start to just miss just the 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 comfort and the ease of of those relationships before yeah yeah um i know how much you both love schlepping all over the country when you tour so uh somebody asked i thought a great question are you enjoying this virtual process of promoting your novel as opposed to schlepping all over the country yes yes Lily's <laughs> like, yeah, no question. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't wish a pandemic on anybody. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I, I have loved getting comfortable with this format because it was something I never, you know, people would say, let's Skype. And I'd be like, no way. I'm so self-conscious. And now I'm so used to it. And I find it very, um, com you know, a communal. I really, I do find that there are similarities between this and being in you know in, in a group i mean I, I do miss of course the live yeah vibe that happens in a room every audience is different and you feel it and it has a personality and a voice and i miss that kind of communication and i miss the line and meeting everybody and signing books and and i i do miss all that but i don't miss the airports and i don't miss the hotel rooms at all yeah <laughs> what about you madeline no, I feel I feel the same way. I feel like it, it's trade offs, you know. That on one hand, um, I I really really miss meeting readers face to face and getting to talk with them and being yeah. in a room. And oftentimes I, I speak to schools. I really miss speaking to students, um, and you know, just getting to hear from people. And it's just there. There's there's nothing else like it. And go to amazing independent bookstores. I mean, that is so exciting to get to yeah. walk into an incredible bookstore and talk to passionate booksellers. And I always walk out with like five books. So by the time I get home, my suitcase is you know bursting. <laughs> um, but I don't miss the suitcase part. 
yeah. and the schlepping part. And I think that one of the nice things about this though, aside from getting rid of all the travel logistics is sort of twofold for me. One is that I can talk to people all over the world. Um, that you know that the accessibility thing is is really exciting. So I, I don't get to see people face to face, but I do get to, you know, have interactions with people who wouldn't have otherwise been able to come to my events, and I wouldn't have been able to answer questions from them. So that's really exciting, and and also it doesn't kind of take over my my day this quite the same way that you know for example this morning I even did a little writing, whereas normally if I were doing yeah. an event that I travel to, forget it. Exactly. And so, yeah. Yeah, so true. I had dinner with my family. <laughs> yeah. Same. Amazing. Yeah. I didn't have to do the dishes. I didn't have to do the dishes. Somebody's wondering about how you both start your books. Do you have an outline and know what is going to happen, or does the story progress as you write it? Hmm. Hmm. Good question. You want to go, Lily? <laughs> <laughs> You're like, hmm, do I um, know? <laughs> um, um, I, I, I actually have a. Uh, this is what I have. The, the closest thing I, I have to. Um, out the visual. Yeah, for show and tell. I always make this a little time. Yeah, turn it the other way. No, it's it's oh. it's vertical. It's this oh, one. You have to go right, 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 right. Okay. So I, it's chronological, and so you know, here's the beginning of the book, and then here's the idea that the book is moving along, and it it's not like chapters oh, or um, uh, it, it's not organized in that way. It's just like little tiny moments that I try to hit, and and sometimes. I don't make that. I, I think it's a terrible idea once I get there and then and I have to go in a different direction. But at the beginning, this it really will help me a lot. And then and then I take notes and stuff and I just have a lot of notes that I actually keep in the back of the notebook, you know, in the in the way back I keep a bunch of notes and so when I'm writing the first chapter, I get ideas and then I just I try to make everything go into this notebook, you know, oftentimes I get ideas when I wake up or when I go to sleep or in the middle of the night or in my car or in the shower, I take it all down and then I try to just make sure that it gets to the notebook. So that, that's kind of my disorganized organization. <laughs> so cool. I bet yours is a little bit more um, systematic. <laughs> no, I was going to say that's more organized than me. <laughs> That's really. Um, funny. I need. I need the end. That's what I need to know. I need to know what the end is, and not the language of the end because I haven't developed the character's voice yet, and not the specifics, all the mechanics of the end, but sort of the ending note. I need to know what the ending yes. note is, and then for me, the search is where's the beginning, and I'm sort of trying to grope around in the darkness and find where the beginning is, and then once I have the beginning and the end, now I feel like I can shoot the arrow. And I can sort of aim aim towards that. And sometimes I'll have ideas about, I know I want to pass through like particular scenes that I want to pass through that kind of come to me as I start to think about the character. Um, but a lot of it I, I develop as I go with Cersei, there were basically four major myths about Cersei that I wanted to hit. And they were kind of like the pillars of the novel mm -hmm. and everything else in between was total invention um, and how those connected were, was invention and how those things, those myths developed. Cause Cersei oftentimes her role in those things is not fleshed out at all. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so oftentimes I'll have sort of like things like that, sort of what I think of as pillars that are, that I'm going to pass through, but how that passing through happens is very organic. And I, I, I often don't know um, the importance of an episode until I get to it. So interesting. I always know the emotional arc, like, yes. like you know, the ending, I, 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 there's always an emotional note, as you say, just a, a, a mood. I always say, at the end that I want to get to and then I and I know that there's going to be a lot of other things that happen but I, I and I'm kind of feeling my way but I have a sense of the emotional journey of the character yes yes 
Really? Yeah, that, that's what I meant by that ending is sort of, yeah, knowing how yeah. that, how that arc is going to, is going to resolve. Yeah. I love the idea of shooting the arrow though. It's very, it's very Greek myth like of you. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody was actually asking Lily because you're so you're thinking so much about the emotional arc when you're writing. Does that mean you have to then go back in and sort of add plot points or you know sort yeah. of beef up that piece? I mean, to me as a reader of yours, it's so you're such a natural. There's so much natural tension in every story of yours I've read, but I don't know how hard that's been for you to like put in after you've you've done the emotional work. You know, I'm just kind of following it along. I don't put in a lot of stuff after the first, well, that's not true. After like this third draft. <laughs> first draft, first I, draft. Really, I definitely throw things in there. But then it's like childbirth. I can't even remember, uh -huh. you know, what didn't exist and, you know, how painful was the very first draft and, and what wasn't there. It's all a little bit blurry to me. And I'm always surprised that you know, when I go back and look at the actual first draft of how much isn't there, because it feels like it was always there. Um, and, and, and so I don't, I, but I usually don't go back and put major, major things in there. I'm, I'm usually just kind of finding my way from the beginning to the end. How do you know when your story is done? Hmm. You just feel it. You just feel it. It's such a, a strong feeling for me. But I don't, I don't often know it that morning. Like when I sit down to write that morning, I don't know that I'm going to like, I'm, But then at the end of the day, you're like, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. You, I write a sentence. And I'm like, oh, I guess that was the end, wasn't it? But how, how is it for you, Adeline? Well, I'm a huge, huge editor. I edit and edit and edit. I just revise so, so many times. And I, I, I oftentimes will read it out loud. I walk around with the manuscript. I read it out loud to myself. I'm, you know, constantly. I'm, so by the time I'm doing like serious final edits, I have it all printed out and I'm, and I'm writing on the page. Um, until that point, I'm, I'm on the computer. But when I start obsessing about punctuation, that's when I'm like, I feel like it's done. Like I'm, you know, my, my husband is, is an amazing editor and, and also a writer. And so when I'm like grabbing him in the hallway, I'm like, semicolon or comma, semicolon or comma here. What do you think? And you know, when I grab, <laughs> right. And he's like, it really doesn't matter. I'm like, what do you mean? This is extremely important. So when I get to that level, I, that's what I've done. <laughs> Do you feel like uh, somebody's asking once your book is published, are there things you want to change or rewrite? They're asking whether that based upon current events or new perspectives, but I'm just sort of curious in general, like, do you ever feel like, now that I thought about it, kind of wish. I can't go there. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I'm really glad. I never read it over. I never, you know, yeah. What about you? I think that's the weird thing that people don't know, really, is that by the time you're talking about the book in a bookstore, maybe three months after the book has come out, you put that book to bed yeah. a year ago. Yeah. And you're already moved on to the next thing, hopefully. Right? Yeah. I feel like... Yes, I so there's only one thing that I, that I have ever gone back and changed, which was... Um, I felt like after Circe came out that it was not clear that Telegonus, her son, was not straight. So I changed one word that I felt like made it more clear. <laughs> um, and uh, other than that, I, I don't go back. And, I, and that was something that was kind of churning in my brain. I was like, is that clear? Was that clear? Was that clear? Um, and so I decided for the paperback to change, to change that, that one word. But um, I think... Otherwise, I feel that when I write the book, I'm so deeply submerged in it. It's like I'm, I'm living in this, in this lake. And then when I finish the book, I, I come out 
And if I tried to, you know, five years later, go back in, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be the same. I, I have moved on. You know, I was a complete master of that world at that moment. I was so fully in it. I was thinking about it on all these different levels. I had, I had worked through all these problems. And to try and come back now, I, I think that wouldn't work. I need to trust that I did the best possible thing I could do at the time. Mm -hmm. and not second guess that. So I, I agree, Lily, I don't go there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, not, I'm not reading Song of Achilles at the, weekend, at the weekends with a, with a red <laughs> pen. It's perfect, I can tell you. Oh. <laughs> um, all right, we'll just do two more. Let's see. Um, what would you tell your characters if you could speak to them directly? I think I would say thank you. I think I would say thank you for for letting me tell this story. Thank you for for being with me and teaching me things through your story, and for letting me letting me be the voice for this. Wow, that is so beautiful. I was gonna say help is on the way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, you're gonna be okay. <laughs> <laughs> Both those things are true. I think that's a perfect place for me to stop with the questions. I want to thank you both so much. Working with you two is what makes my job such a joy. And I'm so lucky. You're very emotional. Um, and I'm just so happy we got to see each other's faces. And I want to thank all of you who came to listen to us talk. I want to encourage you to join us on August 5th, which is our next event. We're going to be uh, talking with Leslie Tenorio about his debut novel, The Son of Good Fortune. Um, not to sound all agenty, but I really, really, really want to ask you guys to consider uh, going out and buying these wonderful books, but really buying any book. Um, I'm, I'm surprised by how many people have said to me like, this is supposed to be booming right now. I mean, everybody's home with so much time to read, right? And I would be like, no, no, that's not <laughs> how it works at all. Uh, business is not booming. Uh, bookstores are really in trouble. Um, only about a third of all independent bookstores in the country are operational. Um, something like 85% of all libraries are not open. 30% um, of their budgets, I heard, are getting slashed. Um, authors are not on tour. They're not selling books. You know, when you go to an event in a store and you meet them and they sign your book, then you're incentivized to buy the book at these wonderful Zoom virtual events. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. um, and authors' livelihoods uh, depend on these book sales. And these bookstores so need your support. Um, I know it's really convenient, but there are so many reasons why you should not be ordering your books on Amazon and why you should be going, if not to your local library and to your local bookstore, then to bookshop.org, which is a wonderful way to pick a bookstore anywhere in the country, pick your local bookstore, pick no bookstore, it doesn't matter. If you need to understand why it's not great to be buying your books on Amazon, there are jillions of articles out there on the wonderful World Wide Web that you can read. You don't need me to spend this time telling you why. Um, I believe that listening to a book is the same as reading a book. So, you know, Libro.fm is a great alternative to Audible.com because Audible is owned by us. Um, okay, I will stop and get off my soapbox and just say thank you to everybody at the JCC, especially Joy Levitt, who has given me this opportunity to bring all these authors that I love and I work with. And um, it's so much fun for me to have an opportunity to talk to them and to introduce all of you to their work. And I hope you guys will join us on August 5th. Um, stay safe. For God's sakes, please wear your masks. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Julie. Thank you.